Okay. Well, thank you for coming to this. This is our first virtual program that we've had. Um, and traditionally in the winter, we've had our travel series and uh, hmm. to talk about the exotic places we've all been when it's the middle of the winter. Um, and while we wish you could all be in our new building, um, this is seems like a great way to do this. Um, I know Pete has participated in a couple of these. He's presented and I've I viewed a, a variety of them. So I really appreciate that you're supporting the library um, and that you're continuing to be part of the library in this virtual way. Uh, that said, the library is open and we are um, uh, um, welcoming people inside as well as still doing curbside services. So feel free to stop in um, when we're open, which is our regular hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 10 to five and Thursday, 10 to eight and Saturday morning from 10 to two. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Lisa Murray. I'm the director of the library. And um, like I just said, we're recording. So I'll have this up on the, up on the website later. Uh, so you can refer to other people who couldn't come. Um, tonight we are welcoming Pete Madeira, who will be talking about walking and visiting Luxembourg. Uh, Pete and his wife Suzanne have visited annually, except this past year, um, and have come to love the small country since their daughter Heather and her family moved there in 2004. Tonight they will share a variety of images of their travels and share some history and background about the country and the places they have explored over the years. Uh, tonight is our first uh, travel talk of our 2021 series. Uh, we will follow up next month with Art Payne on March 9th at 7 p.m. And he'll be speaking about the Bahamas Out Island Regatta. I have that event up on our website and Facebook, and you can sign up for that um, now. And then on Tuesday, April 13th, I will be presenting... Um, and talking about my trip uh, in 2019 to the Azores. Um, in March, the library will be celebrating Women's History Month, as we always do with an art show. We'll also have that online and we will have several programs which we have yet to pin with the dates on yet. So stay tuned for more information on that. Um, and before I turn the program over to Pete, I wanted to request that you all stay muted during the, um, during the talk and we'll have a question and answer period afterwards. If you have any questions that you that come up, if you wanna put them in the chat on the, um, you can go to the chat down on the bottom and if you can direct them to me and it actually doesn't really matter, but ideally to me, then I, when Pete is done talking, I'll, we'll answer those questions first and then I'll unmute everybody and, we can have individual questions. Um, and just a reminder that I can't control how your Zoom feed looks to you in terms of the layout with the pictures. That's something you'll have to control yourself. There's a view icon on the top right um, that will help you can have the pictures on the top or on the side. And I think you can mm -hmm. even make, eliminate them altogether. Pete will be sharing his desktop. So that will be the main, the main view. Um, and if you're having any technical issues, if you want to send a message to me in the chat, I'll see if I can help you out in the background uh, during, the, during the program. So with that, I will turn it over to Pete Madeira. Hey, everybody. It's great to see so many folks out tonight. Oh, wait, we didn't have to go out, did we? We just stay home on our fuzzy slippers and, and uh, watch the computer screen. So... Um, before I get started with the slides, I just wanted to give you a little background. Suzanne and I um, knew absolutely nothing about Luxembourg until 2004 when our daughter Heather and her husband Leon, and at that point one granddaughter, our oldest granddaughter, moved from Scotland to Luxembourg for work purposes. They're both professional musicians and you'll see a couple pictures of them. Um, and, um, but we've, we've basically visited pretty much annually 
um, for the last 15 years, 16 years, except for this year, obviously, because we couldn't go to Europe. Um, and um, we love it. We've really, you know, it's a tiny country, um, 40 miles north and south. So if you're on Mount Desert Island, it's, it's uh, closer than going to Bangor and 20 miles east and west, but it's very diverse. Um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, of course, European history, and which you'll see some pictures of. And um, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. So without further ado, why don't I, I'm gonna, this is my second Zoom presentation and I'm still learning how this all works. But anyway, I will see if we can get right into the slides. So Luxembourg is, um, in the southern part of Luxembourg, it's very, um, it's, it's built up, that's where the city is. And in the north, it's, um, it's more rural and um, uh, you'll see some pictures of this. So this is what the city looks like from down in what's called the Grund. It's where the two rivers come together, uh, the Alzette and the Petrus. Now I'm trying to figure out why. Um, but then up north, uh, Luxembourg has uh, the most hiking trails per capita of any EU country. So this is what, you know, you know when you go up north into the, into the more uh, rural area, this is what it looks like, trail sign. Lisa, I'm having a little trouble um, so just to get you oriented, there's Luxembourg inside the red circle, um, tiny country surrounded by France to the south, Belgium to the east and north, and Germany to the east, Belgium to the north and west, and Germany to the east. A little closer look, Luxembourg city in the south, and um, the Ardennes Forest to the north, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But you can see some familiar names, Bastogne in Belgium, Trier in Germany, um, and Luxembourg City. One thing you immediately notice up north is, um, you know, it's very, it's very wooded. And for those of you that are uh, into forestry, you'll see these uh, patches that have that are all single single species. So that's a, a patch over on the far far side of uh, a single species forest. And that's the way the Europeans have done it for years. I think they're they're starting to shift away from that. But and here's another one. These are these are taken from hikes that Suzanne and I did uh, in the Ardennes forest. And here's. Uh, Suzanne in the middle with Hannah on the left and Charlotte on the right on a walk up in the up in the Ardennes. These are what the trails look like. They're not there's no mountains, uh, but it's very steep sided to the uh, in these gullies that you'll see. And one day we were on a walk and and somebody in a farm had had put uh, all these implements out, just sort of gathered them up. It was nothing formal, but just, uh, um, you know, they gathered up. There's a cider press that Suzanne's looking at and a bunch of other implements that was, was kind of helping with that. Also in the north, there's a, a fair bit of agriculture and I do not know what this is that's being grown, but it's obviously a commercial forest, commercial harvesting that's going on there. As you can tell from Suzanne's rain gear, it's raining. So the other thing, um, as I said, there's a lot of hiking trails. Um, and here is an abandoned, well, not really abandoned, but it's a former rail line that goes through a tunnel. And they have maintained the tunnel with lighting and for bicycles and for walking. So we just we're on this walk and all of a sudden came on this tunnel, which 
was very pleasantly lit. And if you don't know what that is, that is a stand for hunting boar. And when uh, there's a lot of oak forest there in the, and boar-like acorns, so the, you'll come across these every once in a while. We have not had the pleasure of running into a boar. Thank you all very much. There, as I said, there is a lot of hiking trails and other kinds of trails, and this, you'll run across these signs as you're walking. Um, there's, um, so there's a bike path that meets a hiking trail that meets a trail that is actually maintained by the, the CFL, which is the rail system. They encourage people to ride the trains uh, one stop and then walk back to another one. By the way, all of the all of public transportation in Luxembourg is free at all times now. You can't ride to Paris, but you can ride within the country for free. In the Ardennes Forest, which is up north, is of course where the Battle of the Bulge took place. So um, there's a museum in the town of De Kirch, which uh, I think the guy which started it the first time. We went, it was still private. Now it's public, but the guy that started it um, had basically gone out in the woods and gathered up stuff that had been abandoned by both, by both the Germans and by the, the Americans. And uh, here is um, a tank, I guess it's a Sherman tank with our grandson Brady standing in front of it. Um, all kinds of stuff. And here's inside the museum is a uh, play of medical equipment, and we thought it was appropriate since Rosie is an RN, that she have her picture taken. But it's all, uh, it's all very well done. And this is a huge chainsaw, a German chainsaw that was abandoned, and Alicia just giving us an idea of how big it is. So on the east side of the country, on the German side, the terrain changes pretty dramatically and it's called the Mullertal and Petit Suisse, supposedly looking like Switzerland. We've done a number of hikes there, it's very different. Um, see how uh, eroded, you know, cliffs, it's all throughout the area, it's cliffs and, um, and uh, gullies and gorges. And in some places, they have provided metal staircases for you to move up and down. And there, there are some, there are roads that go through the area, but uh, they're they're infrequent and they're not wide. Typical. Typical road in the in the uh, rural area is paint a white band at the base of the tree so at night you can see where the edge of the roadside is. And to get from one level to the other, of course, you have these uh, hairpin turns. So when you're hiking, the one of the nice things is uh, frequently when you're going off for a hike. Um, before you start, you uh, stop at a cafe for a, for a cappuccino and a snack. And then uh, partway through the hike, you might find an adult beverage. So Lux Luxembourg City has been a, well, I guess you'd have to say a military center for about 200 years ending in the middle of the 19th century. Um, lots of uh, defensive fortifications and occupation by the Spanish, the Dutch, uh, the French, and the Prussians all occupied the country and built up these defensive uh, things called the casemates. Um, and in, in 1867, there was a treaty which caused the casemates to be basically demilitarized, but the evidence is still there. 
um, we had the, because Heather works for a private school in Luxembourg, the faculty hired this guy, Francois, who is a um, retired English teacher. He's, fr he's originally from Luxembourg City and he taught English in the Luxembourg City school system for 30 years. And he's now a docent to show the, the casemates. Now you, you can go into the casemates by paying a Euro. Well, the faculty at St. George's School hired Francois to come and give us a tour. Um, and he was a delight. I mean, he knew more about the casemates. I learned more about the casemates than you could ever possibly know, but um, we're, we're about to go into, into our first casemate and that's the entrance, which he had the keys to. Yeah, these are, he's, he's gonna take us places that nobody else can go. So part of the casemates, you know, as I said, there were several countries that occupied Luxembourg. Um, and these were, uh, des these defensive positions were designed by the French uh, engineer Vauban, who um, they're open on one side. And the idea was that if somehow they got overrun, they would be useless to the, to the group that overran them. This is an original gate to the city um, facing France. So there, the fear was always that the French would overrun Luxembourg, which they did. But um, so this originally, with, it's still in use as a access point, but the, um, uh, originally they would drop the gate down in the night and then reopen it in the morning. And the little house on the side was so if somebody wanted to get in, they could holler at a gatekeeper to let him in. These buildings were built by the Spanish, who were, I didn't mention that earlier, but the Spaniards also occupied Luxembourg. And they built these uh, buildings, which are now used as housing for the elderly, but originally were barracks for the Spanish troops. And this was the originally the, um, uh, the cook shack or the, the, the galley for the for the Spanish troops, but it later was changed into a chapel. And they're trying to find the trying to find the resources to upgrade it because it's not it's not in very good shape. You can't go in there. And here's evidence of a um, of more of the casemates. These, this originally was a cannon site on two levels. Now, of course, they've got windows in it, but originally it was, it was for cannons uh, as a defensive position. This is the view from the casemates down into the Grund, which is at the river. And Suzanne and Charlotte taking a break and the casemates were large enough at some point that they could, they could house 5,000 troops and had room for their horses. They had bakeries, they had, and all that stuff. And that was all, you know, inside these, inside these, um, uh, this is down at the river. A night shot. And this is a, a cannon position that has been opened up. Alicia and Brady showing off, they, they can get up there. And, um, but the, the treaty in 1867 required them to demilitarize them. So that's why they got opened up. In the middle of, on, in the, the village, the, this, the city, I should say, of Luxembourg on on Wednesdays and Saturdays, they have a open market, and here's the here's the flower section. The Duke, the the the, the country is a constitutional monarchy, um, and it's a uh, the Duke is the head of it, and he lives he actually lives part of the time in the city and part of the time up in the country. And if he's there, there are two guards. And if he's 
not there, there's only one guard. So he, apparently he's not there today. Brady was, I, I talked Brady into uh, going over and just standing next to the guy. The south of Luxembourg, um, south of the city, there were ore deposits, iron ore deposits discovered in the early part of the 19th century and uh, kind of a low grade ore, um, but with help from Britain, the ore was improved in quality and um, they actually, Luxembourg became the center of, uh, of steel production. And here's some evidence that this, that's, all, that's all ancient history now, but um, today the economy is based entirely on banking. Um, but here's some evidence of uh, the, ore, the ore activity that in, down in the south of Luxembourg. The, um, uh, it's not the largest, but it's, it's one of the larger American military cemeteries in Europe is located in Luxembourg near the city. And so there's 5,700 um, American soldiers buried there. Um, and it's always impressive to go. And among others, uh, George Patton is buried there. And if you don't know his story, he was the military governor of Luxembourg and southern Germany at the end of World War II. And uh, he survived the war, but um, he was on his way to go boar hunting in um, late November of uh, 45. And there was a lorry accident right in the center. There's lots of different caps. So this is um, Berdorf, Berdorf Castle. Most of them are kind of run down. That is Borscheid Castle. And this is in La Rochette. And I, the next picture I kifed off the internet, I saw it the other day and it was actually from two days ago. Same castle, but with snow. And this is the Anden Castle, which is open and a museum. And of course, when you go to Luxembourg, you know, you're 10 minutes from France and 15 minutes from Germany and 12 minutes from Luxembourg, Belgium. So you tend to travel around. So we're, this is a, a picture taken from Germany looking back toward. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the town, but um, looking back across the Moselle River into, into Luxembourg. And in Germany, they have a uh, similar sign situation, you know, lots of hiking, Germans love to hike. And Trier is um, not far away. That was a very important Roman uh, city where uh, it was on the trade route between Northern Europe and uh, Rome. And so this is Porta Negra built by the Romans. It's never actually finished, but this is the main gate to get into the city of Trier in Roman times. And we went out in, into the countryside in Germany and these folks were just bringing their horses out for the summer. And a, in France, this is, uh, um, what's the name of that town? Um, small, small town in France that we have visited several times. And this is um, World War, pre-World War II Maginot Line uh, position that France built, trying to keep the Germans from overrunning them, which obviously didn't work. Another Maginot Line uh, that was a pop-up thing. They, they could pull it down if they were under attack or put it up to see what was going on. So during, during World War II or pre-World War II, the Germ, um, Hitler 
wanted Luxembourg to become a province of Germany. And um, so he did a referendum and uh, had people vote as to what they wanted to do. And I think the referendum was skewed to the answer he wanted, but basically the response that he got from um, the Luxembourg's population was, we wanna remain what we are. So at that point, We can yes, take... I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Well, I'm sorry, you dropped out there for a minute. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I'm just, uh, I, I finished the slideshow. So okay. if anybody has any questions or um, comments or criticisms, I'm happy to hear them. Yes, and please unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Just so you know, Pete, your audio was um, fading in and out a little bit. Oh, really? That. So you may have some questions related to some of the things that okay. may have. Sure. Yes. It wasn't too bad, but it, it was just for a second at a time. It looks like Bob okay. has a question. Probably my internet connection. Hi, Pete. It's yeah, hi. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Uh, <laughs> Good. So I saw some of the signs were in French. What was that all about? Well, French is the national language. Oh, um, no, uh, for business. For what? For business. For business. And they have a language. Luxembourg. Well, they, 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 there's a language, Luxembourgish, which if you didn't grow up in Luxembourg, you probably don't know. Now, Heather has learned it because she became a, a citizen, but French is the language of the judiciary and of the legislature. So pretty much everybody, oh, everybody speaks French, and um, and if you're over on the eastern side toward the Moselle River, which is the border with Germany, um, people speak German. But everybody speaks French, pretty much Luxembourgish if they grew up there, and English if they, you know, pretty much speak English too. Okay. I know you're- time I had trouble with somebody not, I was not able to communicate. Now I don't speak German and my French is uh, minuscule, um, but I, um, the only time I, I had trouble was I was trying to buy sausage at the, at the market in Luxembourg city, you know, at the open market. And uh, the lady there spoke no English and we were definitely on different pages. So she got her son who was working in back <laughs> yeah. I know your daughter had to learn, uh, Heather had to learn Luxembourgian to become officially a citizen or? Yes. She has a passport. Passport. She has dual citizenship. They are not muted. No, are not muted. Hi, Pete. Hi. Hi, it's Susan and Jim Buck. Hi, how are you guys? Have I done this right? Wait a minute, let me just see. Okay, I've got the video on. I've got the unmute in. I don't see us, but anyway, I don't know. Well, you just need to move your uh, move your camera a little bit, maybe. Um, move the camera. Well. There we go, I can see you. Can you see us? Okay, well, we can't okay. see us. So anyway, Pete, that was really interesting. Jim and I haven't been to Luxembourg in many, many years, but we loved our trip there and really enjoyed your talk tonight. Good. Um, I, I just would like to look, know a little more, if you can, about, tell us about your, your kids and their living there and what are they doing? Oh, okay. Well, so Heather and Leon are both professional musicians. Um, they um, met at Boston University School of Music and then moved to Temple in Philadelphia for advanced degrees and then went to the Royal Academy in London for another advanced degree. Um, and Leon, uh, he, he, he'd done a couple of different things, but he wound up as the principal trombone for the Luxembourg Orchestra, which is the Orchestra uh, Philharmonie du Luxembourg. And um, uh, 
Uh, so he's the principal trombone and she teaches at St. George's School and they do lesson, private lessons and she has filled in with the orchestra when they need an extra trumpet. So he's a trombone player, she's a trumpet player, but they also play a bunch of different instruments. Well, that's fascinating. That's just, just amazing. So I'm trying to figure out, we're still watching, we have a slide of you and then you're down the lower hand corner. So Lisa, maybe you can um, tell me what, what do I do to see the people who are talking? Lisa, what do I do here? Um, I think if you look on, um, if you look on the right side of your screen, there should, on the top right, there's a button that says view. I've got, um, well, you know, I, I do this all the time and it seems to work, but somehow I'm having trouble now. Okay, wait a minute, here I've got to switch to gallery view. That'll yes. give it. Yes. There we are. You got it. Okay. Okay. Well, Pete, thank, thank you. And Lisa, thank, thank you so much for, for doing this. We're, we're, of course, in sunny Florida, as opposed to where you all are up there. It's much warmer down here. But we really enjoyed your talk tonight. Thank you. I should, I should complete the answer and, and say that uh, our oldest granddaughter, Hannah, who studied, who went to school in, um, in Luxembourg at the, at the English, at the British school, um, she's now an art student in Paris. So what's wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. Wow, what, what an experience for the kids. I'm, I'm just <laughs> envious of them that they're having this wonderful growing up yeah. out of the world experience. Yeah, unfortunately with COVID, the school has been just like here, has been back and forth on whether they can actually be there. Oh, okay. Well, it's good to see some of you. We see some of your names um, and we can't see others. Susan Edson, we can't see you. I don't know where you are. And uh, I don't know where Janet. Oh, there you are, Janet. What, can you see us? We can't see us. Okay, well, what am I doing wrong here, Lisa? Um, Susan, Susan Bach, if you um, click on yeah. your video, uh, un unclick the video. I think that might be the problem. Okay. Uh, oh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Anyway, Pete, we got to do it. For some reason, we can't get the start video to, to start, but that's okay. We got to see you tonight. So that was good. We miss you all. And thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. Pete. Hi. Hi, it's Lee. Oh, hi, Lee. Um, so, um, in contrast to Americans who have uh, not been invaded by any foreigners, um, Luxembourg has really been the doormat to foreign, right there. Yeah, stand. foreign uh, armies for thousands of years. How do you find the difference in our um, perspective of sense of security, um, place in the world. Um, do, you, do you see any difference in it? Um, well, that's a, that's a great question. I, you know, the, the whole experience for people that, first of all, I, I don't know what the percentage is now, but, but there's a huge percentage of people who um, the, the, original residents of Luxembourg today is about 60% of the actual population. So oh, nice. there's people, people coming in from, um, com coming Portuguese. in from Portugal is a big, you know, there are a lot of Portuguese that live in Luxembourg. Um, there's some Italians, a lot of, well, French, not so much. They, they, but they get something like 60,000 people a day commuting into the city. So part of the reason they're getting, they have free transportation is they're trying to keep people out of the, out of the country with cars. Um, I mean, it's a very different experience there. Does that come anywhere close to hitting what you were looking for? Well, he asked how they felt. And we know that some, I'll sneak in here. This is Suzanne, this is Suzanne's going to tell me what I did wrong. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to say to answer more about your question, Lee, um, there are people 
a lot of people in Luxembourg kind of resent their country being taken over by so many um, outsiders, not Luxembourg Luxembourgers, but a lot of the people are very open to it also. Having other people there, it increases the cultural experience and um, Spitz, so Heather Spitz. and Leon have lots and lots of friends who are English speaking. Some are American and many are British. And um, then a lot of English speaking people that are actually not, that's not their native language. But anyway, I, I think it's a mixed, a mixed um, feeling toward outsiders in Luxembourg. Does that answer it, Lee? Uh, yeah. Uh, to, uh, to some degree, it's, um, you know, there's so much that we take for granted about our, our territorial integrity. And mm -hmm. it's always yeah. fascinating to me how particularly these countries in Europe that have just seen. I think there's, I think there's a lot of fear in Europe of being homogenized, you know, so they don't want to become the United States of Europe, for one thing. You know, they like, they want their, the French want their, their French, French, they want to be Francais and the Germans, mm -hmm. the same thing. Um, Luxembourg is so small, they get overwhelmed no matter what you do. They're, you know, they're getting inundated every day with people commuting in from France, Belgium, and Germany. Um, and with, with demands that, you know, they want, they want thing, it's, it's, it's it's difficult, you know? so I, I don't I feel badly for the people that, you know, two generations ago were were um, it wasn't like that. You know, after World War II, they re, the Marshall Plan helped them really recover, um, and then and then all of a sudden the banking industry came in and really changed things. Uh, Bob, do you have a question? Yes, um, I noticed. Uh, that you were in the Ardennes. The Ardennes Forest was a major battle, I believe, during World War II. Battle of the Bulge. That right. Were there any, I saw some tanks and things, but were there any other uh, memorials or signs that there'd been a major conflagration there? Oh yeah, well, for one thing, in, in the town of Clairvaux, which we visited several times, actually you can take the train from you know, you basically don't need a car. You can just take the train to Clairvaux, which is a what you call a spa town. Um, it's not big. I mean, it's not it's not big at all, but it's got some high end hotels. Um, so, first thing you notice is walking from the train station toward town. Uh, there are plaques on the side of houses or uh, these stucco buildings that say, "This is the." I'm translating here, but it says this is the the home of such the such and such a family who sheltered Jews during the dur during World War II, or, or and they give the dates because you know Luxembourg was overrun early in the war and then got pushed out and then got overrun again in the north part uh, during the Battle of the Bulge. So the fear was that the Luxembourgers who sheltered people, they were afraid of the Germans finding them during the, during the Battle of the Bulge. So, so there's, there's that. And then down in the town square, there's a, a memorial. First, there's a memorial um, to the American division that went through there and pushed the Germans out for the second time. Um, and then there's a second memorial put up by the, the members of the surviving members of that division about 10 years later. And that's, this is recent, this is recent. This is like 20 years ago or less um, saying how much they appreciated how welcoming the people of Clairvaux were to them. And the connection to this part of the world is um, the, the guy who just, he just recently passed away, the coal museum in Bangor, which you see if you come off I-95, I um, he was in Clairvaux during that. So he was part of that division. 
Peter, is uh, Luxembourg part of the European Union? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. And happily so, as far as I can tell. Actually, Luxembourg, Luxembourg, um, the Netherlands, and Belgium were the first attempt at a union in Europe. And following World War II, they uh, created what it was called Benelux, which is which was actually around coal and iron, and not having any um, uh, tariffs between the countries. So that was actually the beginning of it. And how did banking come to be in Luxembourg? I'm not sure, except that the iron industry went out and they encouraged some, they encouraged the banking. And now the EU has its uh, central bank in Luxembourg. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so when you were all doing this hiking, did a lot of that land belong to the state or was it privately owned or? I think, I think the best way to say it is it's, um, it's generally privately owned, but it's, um, it's also a zone and it's also under, you know, it's restricted use. I mean, you can't, you can't go buy an acre of land in the woods up there and put a house on it. Mm -hmm. It's typical European, you know, approach to land use, you know, it's, um, you know, the t they want the towns to be centralized and then have agriculture and other activities be outside of the town. Interesting. Thank you. Hmm. So do your grandchildren speak numerous languages, English, Luxembourg, <laughs> French, German, or? Well, um, they've, they've gone to the British school, which means that basically it's taught in English. Um, Luxembourgish, the only one in the family that really speaks Luxembourgish is Heather, although I think Leon, my son-in-law, is learning it. Um, Hannah has, Hannah needs to learn French because she's studying in Paris and the course she's taking right now is actually taught in English. So uh, unfortunately, um, and I think Hannah and Charlotte is learning some German and I think she speaks some French too. So they're getting exposed to it, but it's unfortunately, it's not like they're immersed. Well, um, it's Susan again, Pete. When Hannah gave up her, I don't know, did Hannah have to give up her citizenship or does she have dual citizenship now? Okay, that's, that's Heather, who is uh, our Heather. daughter. Um, Heather. And, she, and she did not. I mean, she carries two passports. Two passports. Okay, that's good. That's interesting. Yeah. I think that's, that's typical now. Again. All right, are there any other questions? Have you any idea when you'll be able to go back again? You could go to the um, when, when will Suzanne and I are scheduled for COVID vaccinations in Bangor next week? Um, you know, it's, I think it's dependent completely on, on ability to travel to Europe, although I do know People have gone, but I think you go through, you know, all kinds of hoops to, to, to do it. I mean, guess, getting test. Somebody I know just flew from uh, Newark from New York to Luxembourg and was tested three times on that one flight. Wow. So I don't know. I mean, I'd love to go in the fall. I mean, that's typically when we go after boating season here. Okay, Pete. Jim had a question for you and I had us on. Go ahead. I couldn't, Jim, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I just wondered, um, did you go to the catacombs? We went to the catacombs when we were there. In Paris? No, in Luxembourg City. I'm not familiar with it. Um, I, yeah. I guess I'm not familiar with the catacombs in Luxembourg City. We've been to the casemate <coughs> several times. Well, we went there and um, we had a guide that took us through the catacombs. That's apparently <clears throat> there. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah, honey. Okay. There there's, you there's, are. there's something. There are caves and people hid in them during the war. Yes. That well, that's that that's the casemates that are. Um, okay. Well, they were um, from from our, our, but Yeah. We were down by the river. Yeah. That's 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 right. Yeah. Now, do we you went have there a and, okay. and the guide said there were three couples. We were one, and there was a German couple and a Dutch couple. And the guide said, Well, I can give this in English or uh, German or whatever. <laughs> and the Dutch people said, well, they're in, they speak English, so give it to us in English. We're fine with that. And the Germans <laughs> said, no, we can speak English, but we want to hear it in <laughs> German. Yeah. So the guide would take us to a point and give us the English explanation and then turn to the other couple and give it to them in German. And I just <laughs> thought, they spoke English. Why couldn't they just accommodate? Well... <laughs> We, we, we Americans sort of expect to be speaking in English, don't we? <laughs> well, that's the only language I know, actually. Yeah, well, that's the problem, isn't it? Yeah. Now, Pete, in, in terms of tourism there, is there a tourism industry? Are they encouraging tourists? Is, is it mostly Europeans? Uh, mostly Europeans. We see a, see a lot of people, a lot of people. We've, Suzanne and I have run into a lot of people from the Netherlands uh, hiking. Uh, and Germans hiking in Luxembourg. Um, this uh, region that I talked a little bit about, the Mullertal, um, that is the only part of Luxembourg which is long distance hiking. And you can do two loops, which would probably take you five days to hike. And there, the Chamber of Commerce for that region is really trying to encourage it. I'd, I'd like to do that hike, but um, it's not as well organized as say, um, the West Highland Way or some of the stuff we've seen in France. And is there camping or is it an end to end camp, uh, end to end stays? Yeah, it's it's more end to end. I think that's the driver for it is the hotels want to pe want people to stay there. <laughs> um, and, you know, the camping is, uh, there are campsites, but they're not on trails. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, thank you very much, it's, Pete. Uh, it's fun to uh, remember what we've done and hopefully look forward to some stuff we might do in the future. So great to see everybody and uh, thanks. It was fun. Making the and effort. Don't, and, and don't forget to sign up for Art Payne's talk on March 9th. And that, that link will be on our website as well. And I'll send it out in a, in a patron email too, so you can get it that way as well. Thank you, Pete and Suzanne. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see everybody. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. You are welcome. Thank you. Bye. Nice to see you all. Yes, nice to see everybody. Sort of <laughs> in and out here. <laughs> Thank you.